welcome back. Happy New Year to us all, faculty, students, friends, speakers. Tonight's speaker is Raphael Behrman, the Edward P. Bass Distinguished Visiting Architecture Fellow. The Bass Fellowship was made possible by a generous gift of endowment from Ed Bass, a 1968 graduate of Yale College and a member of the class of 1972 in the Yale School of Architecture. Ed Bass plays an important role in the governance of this university. He was a member of the Yale Corporation from 2001 to 2013, serving as senior fellow from 2011 to 2013. His wise counsel continues to be valued, especially as the university addresses stewardship responsibilities for its extraordinary collection of architecture while simultaneously moving forward with new buildings. Since his graduation from Yale, Ed Bass has concentrated his professional life on two preeminently important issues, the environment and the urban condition. His work as an environmentalist extends from his founding of the biosphere experiment in Oracle, Arizona in 1991, to his catalyzing role in the transformation of Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies into a preeminent force for research and advocacy. As a developer, Mr. Bass of Sandown Square was responsible for the revitalization of the once moribund core of Fort Worth, Texas, transforming a collection of derelict historic buildings into a lively entertainment destination and subsequently adding and attracting new construction, including skyscraping office towers, large-scale apartment houses, and important cultural facilities. The Bass Fellowship enables the school to pair a leading developer with resident or visiting faculty offering an advanced studio. Such pairings make possible within the school the kind of interchange between sophisticated architects and sophisticated market-based clients that characterizes much of the best work being done in the field today. Gerald Hines was the first Bass Fellow in 2005, teaching alongside Stefan Banish. Bass Studios have also united the developers of Stuart Lipton of London with Richard Rogers and Chris Wise. Catherine Farley, Senior Managing Director of Tishman Spire, was teamed with Deborah Burke. Vincent Lowe of Hong Kong with the late Paul Katz, Jamie Von Klemperer, and Forth Bagley, Forth being a graduate of our school and Yale College, recent graduate of the firm KPF. Douglas Durst with Bjarke Ingalls, founder, and Thomas Christopherson, partner of the Copenhagen and New York firm Big. We're also a, ba a, ba a Bass pair, as was Alec Isaac Kalisvart of Netherlands-based MAB Development with Alex Garvin and Kevin Gray of our faculty. In fall 2013, the Bass Studio was led by the developer John Spence with Saren and visiting professors Patrick Bellew, founder of the environmental consultancy Atelier 10, and Andy Bow, a senior partner of Lord Norman Foster's office in London. Each of the Bass Studios has been documented in a publication, beginning with Poetry, Property, and Place, published in 2006, and most recent, recently, Rethinking Chongqing, Mixed Use, and Super Dense, documenting the low KPF studio. This spring, that is spring 2015, the Bass book series continues with a review of the work in the studio led by Isaac Kalisvart, and again in fall 2015 with a book reviewing the work in the studio led by John Spence, Patrick Bellew, and Andy Bow. This term's Bass professor, Raphael Beermann, is teamed with associate professor adjunct Sunil Ball, Balt. After studying economics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Raphael Behrman, in 1979, founded with his father, Aaron Behrman, Behrman S.A., a private real estate company in his native Sao Paulo, Brazil. Since the founding of Behrman S.A., Societe um, Anonyme, uh, for those of you who want to know, um, Mr. Behrman has a, a developed many real estate projects, but he is best known for a number of office buildings in Sao Paulo, 
that have had a significant impact on the market. Two very important beer month projects are now underway. The first is a 50,000 square meter office building set on a four acre site on the prestigious Faria Lima Avenue, a project that will also include a public plaza and a 500 seat black box theater and introduce to the Sao Paulo marketplace North American concepts of urbanism, asset management, and placemaking. Mr. Bierman's second project, situated in the Federal District of Brasilia, encompasses over 2 billion square feet, 16 million square meters, that together with neighboring areas aims to establish a walkable and sustainable urban community for more than 400,000 people uh, in, sorry, the relatively new city, or some say city, of Brasilia. <laughs> I have to say, parenthetically, that as a third year student in this school, Lucio Costa came to give a lecture. His English was a bit shaky, um, but it was an amazing lecture. He said, I'm going to show you the new plan of Brasilia. Whereupon on a blackboard, he drew something that looked like an airplane and said, that's it. <laughs> and that was the lecture. For his Yale studio, Mr. Behrman is asking students to propose designs for a key for, uh, a portion of this fascinating and troubling project. Tonight's lecture will be followed by a reception in the Architecture Gallery, where you are all invited to meet our speaker over refreshments and to enjoy the exhibition, Archaeology of the Digital Media and Machines. Now, please welcome Raphael Behrman, 11th Edward P. Bass Visiting Fellow, as he delivers the lecture, Walking from Site to City. Raphael. Thank you, Dennis Stern. Um, it's a real an honor and a pleasure to participate in the Edward Bass Distinguished Visiting Fellowship. I'm really enjoying this, and in more than one way. Early this morning, I called my old Jewish mother. She's always complaining about my, about my uh, deficiencies and always pointing them out to me. And I said, Mom, I got into Yale. <laughs> what? She's a little bit deaf. I said, Mother, I can't explain further. You know how expensive these international calls are. Goodbye. <laughs> so really, I'm glad to be here. Before anything, I have to ask your forgiveness for my broken English and terrible accent, or the reverse, as, as you wish. I hope to be able to communicate some ideas that, that and, and maybe they will make sense to you. Before judging me too harshly, understand that being from Brazil is like being from a different planet. Take the, for instance, take the weather. This is how you are here almost today. <laughs> And this is us in Brazil. <laughs> but that's not only summer. This is winter. <laughs> so it's, anyway, you know, Brazil, we always compare ourselves to the United States. Why can't we be as, as them? Why are they are more uh, richer than us? Why are we are lagging so much behind? The discussion goes on and on. We have so many shortcomings in infrastructure, institutions, equity, finance, not to mention education, professionalism, and law, et cetera. Some say we are the country of the future, and some say we'll ever be. But like the poet once said, it's a mess, but we love it. Let me point to you some of our strengths. In Brazil, we have peaceful borders for the last 140 years, an amazing population of 200 million of diverse people with one language, no religion disputes, no separatists, a strong popular culture with an amazing cuisine and an amazing, yeah, we like the cuisine, right? <laughs> even, even our fruits are great. We, we also are endowed by hydropower, natural resources, and we are the food powerhouse of the world. Fantastic country and 
fantastic landscape and beaches. I'm telling you all this to contextualize my speech and its very personal perspective. As a Brazilian developer, let me talk to you about that. I've been working in real estate since 1977, almost 40 years ago. That year, my father, Aaron, he got ill, he sold his bank, and decided to get into real estate. He was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. And I, just a 24 years old kid, <laughs> not knowing anything about real estate or anything else for that matter, was left in charge. I was eager to learn. I was eager to, eager to learn the trade. One of my many issues was with architects. In Brazil, most architectural schools would never do something like this Edward Bass program, bringing business people to interact with the students. First, first of all, they despise real estate business. Only public buildings with a social agenda would be considered worthwhile. Young architects are taught that clients are obstacles in the way of great projects. I remember back in 1980, I was starting to develop my first office building, and I wanted to retain one of the most acknowledged architects in Sao Paulo, Giancarlo Gasperini. I went to his office and explained the project, and he said, okay, come back in two weeks, I'll have the design for you. I said, no, no, but, but I want to discuss with you, I have some ideas. No, 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 come back in two weeks, and I'll have the, the design for you. I said, I walked out of that celebrated office never to come back. Architecture is the sole art that cannot fulfill itself without a third party. The architect needs the client, and not only because of he or she is the one that set, foots the bill, but also sets the parameters, the market reality, and the budget, and all sorts of the limitations. And that's the real creativity, to do design within constraints. That's the real deal. But the client does not only set the limitations, sometimes, he or she brings visions and dreams. Likewise, no developer can do or can achieve his vision without an architect. Uh, you see, I love architects. Sometimes I even envy you. But it goes away very fast. <laughs> <laughs> so in my career, I focus on office development not an easy job in those times of instability, hyperinflation, high, sky high interest rates in a market without debt or equity. My first office developed in 1980 was a built to suit to Beckton and Dixon headquarters. <coughs> Sorry. Headquarters in Sao Paulo. Less than 4,000 meters. After that, we built a succession of look-alike buildings, for instance, the Arthur Anderson building and others. Today, they look pretty simple buildings. <laughs> but at that time, they were marvels to me. Then we built the Deutsche Bank building, the Deutsche Bank headquarters in Sao Paulo in 1990. It was a breakthrough. It started as a speculative building, speculative development, but had all the specifications of, of a headquarter building, all clad in granite and all that. I know those projects were good, but not great. The more I learned about, the more I learned about buildings, the more I wanted to learn. So when in 1990 we got this terrific site we named it B21, and decided to raise the bar. The simplest way to do that was to retain American architects. Nobody was doing that. Architects, architects in Brazil, they're very protective of their turf. They say, we have one of the greatest architectural traditions in the world. Why do we need foreigners to work here? They don't like foreign architects. 
but they love German cars, they love Scottish whisk, they love French wine. <laughs> to me, the choice was simple. Local design was not up to date with the latest office concepts or technical specifications. They lacked the experience, the volume. While a Brazilian architect at most could have done a dozen buildings, an American firm would have a track record of millions of meters. We came to the US and interviewed several firms and end up retaining Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. I believe their backlog was low at the time and they are glad to get us uh, poor South American developers paying small fees. And we got us their clients. In that project, I worked with TJ Gottes Dinner. <laughs> at that time, TJ, I had hair, TJ had, uh, well, had hair. And this is how we look today. <laughs> We also worked with uh, Mustafa and David Childs. David was the chief designer of the first project. It was a terrific experience. David asked me what I wanted, which design alternative I liked. I was delighted with that change in the client architect relationship. And I took much more home than I could get back there. The building we were doing, the building we were doing had texture, had details, had character, nuances that no other building in town had. We also retained JB and, uh, JB and, uh, JB and B, the New York MP, MEP engineering firm, and several other American consultants from different specializations. The American team, the American team uh, was also mirrored by a Brazilian team. And we used to come here and go back many times, and we had a terrific time. It was a lot of work, but a lot of fun, too. The building was a huge success and set new standards for office buildings in Sao Paulo. And after that, we did a number of buildings. Three, of, three other of them was SOM. We did the Santiago Chile building. And it's a terrific building. Also set the standards there. And we had a terrific tenant's roles, as you can see, Microsoft, JP Morgan, and so on. It was a terrific building. Uh, we did the uh, JP Morgan headquarters in Sao Paulo, very demanding client, and uh, we are happy to be able to do that building. We then, more recently, we did the, uh, what we call a speculative building, B31, that's just next to the site I'll be showing you now, uh, the next talk that we did today. Using American architects and engineers helped me to improve my development. And for a while, my projects were considered the most advanced office buildings in Sao Paulo. I was the most admired, <laughs> envied, and copied developer in town. I was feeling great, <laughs> pleased with myself. But that, that, those are the times you have to watch because Life is a cycle, and in 1990, my company went into the restructuring mode. <laughs> Not everything is rose in a developer's path. You see, here there's another difference from, between America and Brazil. There, banks require full recourse to the bearer's asset every, on every loan. Very different from America. So when you go under in Brazil, you really go under. <laughs> and that's very different from America. Here, Donald Trump can go belly up several times and land back at Forbes Rich billionaire list every time. Not in Brazil. Tough times, but I managed to crawl back. Some scars, some wounds, but still alive and kicking. Older, poorer, but wiser. Well, not to demerit wisdom, sometimes I long for young and rich. <laughs> Sao Paulo, back in 2005, I got my Faria Lima project, B32, rolling again. Two years later, 2007, 
I also would acquire the land of our large urbanization project in the most significant in the most significant embodiment of the modernist city in Brazil, if not in the world, Brasilia. But first, let's talk about the Sao Paulo project. The site is located in the most prestigious business address in Sao Paulo, Faria Lima Avenue. It's a huge site with some uh, 14,000 meters and an FAR, allowing an FAR of four times uh, it comes up to about 52,000 meters of Elizabeth area. Uh, and 120,000 meters of total construction area. That project was a struggle. We had to buy 35 different properties to fully assemble the site. It took us nine years from two 1998 to 2007 to complete that site. We submit the plans for, the, for approvals in 2007, seven years ago, and I still don't have the final approvals. God willing, someday before I finish the building by mid-17, this undoubtedly uh, will arrive, I hope. This has been the most challenging, time-consuming, nerve-wracking real estate deal I've ever done. I'm partially to be blamed for it, for my fixation on making this building not only a landmark design and a state-of-the-art technical installation, but also a statement to urban integration. The project was to me an opportunity to explore the relationship between the building and the city, to walk from the site to the city, as I say, searching a new look to the city and a new look into Sao Paulo or Brazil's urban issues. My city, Sao Paulo, as many others uh, in Brazil, are in chaos today. How I see this? Too much government intervention and regulations, obsolete hygiene concepts, ventilation, setbacks, and a maximum FAR of four produced a sea of disconnected buildings. Legal, legal developers were subject to excessive regulations for urbanization, for urbanization projects, but squatters and illegal occupations were granted incentives by the government. This resulted in the favelization of our cities. Good intentions plus bad ideas always produced terrible and disastrous results and trigger up the law of unintended consequences. Sorry. Step. We have what I call door-to-door -door urbanism. The street, the public realm, where people would interconnect, interact, become just a passage from one door to the other. The way I see, we can trace many of those issues to the modernism, urbanism. The segregation of functions, the low density, extra-wide avenues, all these led to the stretching of distances, infrastructure costs, and consequential infrastructure deficiency. And this cycle has led to cities without mobility, where we lost our streets to the traffic jam, we lost our civility, we lost the public space, and we lost urbanity. And the, most war, the, the worst and most damaging concept from modernism was the tabula rasa. In our desire to be modern, in our anxiety to reach the future by shortcuts, by cutting loose our links to our past, to our East history, we end up with uh, no cities. That was the most crippling consequence of modernism. And in my personal opinion, had Le Corbusier, the saint patron of modernism, the power to get his way, Paris and Rio and many other cities would be gone for some modernist obliteration 
was a prerequisite to creation. The destruction is part of that legacy of Brazilian modernism. Just one instance, uh, one example for you of this approach. In Sao Paulo, in 1900, we had an electrical tramway system. And in 1933, we had a network of 260 kilometers. That's almost four times what we have today in our crowded subways network. But in 1935, Mayor Prestes Maia decided to he elaborate this plan called the Avenue Plans. And the Avenue Plans was the idea to bring, make lots of new avenues for lots, lots of new cars in Sao Paulo. From, there, from, from that date on, it was all the way downhill until in 1968, when all tramways were totally decommissioned. You know, I like cars. They are practical, fun to use, and even sometimes can help in your love life. <laughs> but, but Brazilian modernists gave car too high a priority. They went all in for that symbol of modernity. Perhaps we could call it car architecture or car architecture. <laughs> this misguided attraction still with us today. Last year, our government was subsidizing cars and gasoline, creating some of the world's worst traffic jams in Brazil. Partially modernism to be blamed. One major problem that I can't blame modernists is what I call the architecture of fear. Crime rates are falling all around the developed world in all big cities, not in Brazil. The concern for security has led to a city of walls, fences, where criminals roam free and everyone else dreams of living in a prison. There is a secondary crime in crime. It kills urbanism. Public space is destroyed by fear. Walls steal our perspective and kidnap our mobility. Back to Berman 32. In the process of design, designing that building, we wanted to explore the relationship between building and city. We felt that our building should be a positive factor in the city. What should we do? DD Pay was the architect. DD Pay is here. And we were putting together the site. Its configuration became an L. The configuration became an L shape with a very long stretch facing Faria Lima, which is, as I told you, the most, um, um, the most prestigious address in Sao Paulo. Most developers would simply put the building facing Faria Lima, the, the biggest, the largest, the frontage of the building Faria Lima. But the DNI decided to set the building in the corner. For that, we freed an enormous, a very large space for a public space. It was an opportunity we couldn't miss. But at the same time, there were some issues. Because you see this small stretch here, it was a small, very small street that exists in the site. I didn't need this street to build the building unless I wanted to free the room, free the space for the, to the, the, the public space. But I decided to go for that that way, and that's what we did. Although it was a very nightmarish, um, uh, difficult approval process, as you can imagine. But such a public space would be such a powerful statement and example in Sao Paulo that we need to do it. You see, all commercial buildings on Faria Lima and most of other uh, 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 business address, business locations, are behind fences or walls. And even when they have some open ground, 
is just landscape, not public space. I wanted to interact with the city. The building should serve not only its tenants, but the community as well. What makes a property valuable? It is the context, the public setting. In real estate lingo, that's called location. You remember location, location, location. Not only, but that's not location, not only at the address, but the relation to the urban grid and the public space. The way the building connects to the ground and its surroundings. By the way, I have a funny story about that. Another funny story. Didipe, when we were hiring him, sent me a letter saying, if I do this building, my design will in improve the value of all the buildings around. And one of my partners said, Rafael, what crazy architect are you hiring? He's improving the, all the, the, the competition value, not ours. I said, well, that's very simple. Let's do an ugly building and we'll decrease everybody else's value. So we went the other way, of course, and uh, we hope to be doing a very beautiful building, and that will increase everybody else's uh, value. We also wanted to make the public space truly functional, and we asked Fred Kent from PPS to help us define what was required. We designed the, the public space uh, with their help. Many of the pictures, uh, Features they, 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 they help us to define that. We, ha we hired a local young architect, Eiji Hayakawa, to design our 500 seat theater as a public amenity to, to be in our public, uh, public space. And we hired Tom Bosley, the New York um, 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 landscape designer. Tom Bosley. <laughs> he designed the public space, and um, when he was designing the public space, he said, no, Rafael, we need to put a sculpture at this corner to mark the point and cause attraction, do some sort of sculpture pavilion. We didn't know what to do, but then later on, we came with the idea of doing the sculpture of a whale, symbolizing life, sustainability, struggle for survival, and uh, not to not forget, renewal, the story of Jonah, as a, a renew and rebirth. And there we did the design of our whale, and it will sit there as a symbol, and we believe it will be a very appropriate symbol for Sao Paulo's struggle to overcome its chaos and create a more humane, fluid, and dignified urban environment. It's a huge sculpture with some 20 meters, so it will be a big impact there. Wait a minute. Whales and symbols, humane cities. What's all this? Undeveloped chauvinist blood-sucking profiteers? <laughs> what about the bottom line? What about all our fiduciary responsibility to shareholders? Public space? It attracts the strangers and undesirable to the building grounds. These are questions uh, I ask myself every morning when I look in the mirror, but I never get a straight answer. <laughs> How to answer this? Wh what do we do? We where developers stand in society? How we move forward? Developers get no break in Brazil. We, are, we have an horrible reputation. Real estate speculators, it's a steaming default on us. We are considered slightly better than serial killers. <laughs> but are we the same as others? If you prick, do we, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? And if you poison us, do we not die? Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps however undeserving that bad reputation is, some change is needed. We need to look beyond, beyond the limited marketing rec recommendations, beyond the bottom line, beyond the site boundaries. A piece of land is more than a financial opportunity. To think only about money is impoverished. I believe these reflections are relevant for Sao Paulo, 
and more so to our project in Brasilia. But if we talk about Brasilia, we end up talking about urbanism, Brazilian architecture, and inevitably about those three, Oscar Linnemeyer, Lucy Costa, and Le Corbusier. Oops. The influence those three, mainly Nehemiah, had in our country, for better or worse, or for bad or worse, was huge. Someday, someone will figure how and why. And it is unreasonable to blame on them, to blame everything on them, but they represent this approach more than anyone else. Interesting enough, those three had an early interaction. In another project, at the very beginning of Brazilian involvement with modernism in architecture, the design and construction of the Ministry of Educação building in Rio. It all happened in 1936 during the Vargas dictatorship. His Minister of Education, Gustavo Capanema, wanted to build a new headquarters for his ministry in Rio, that at that time was still Brazil's capital. Capanema had a competition to choose the design of the building. A winner was chosen. I don't remember his name. Nobody remembers his name. Because Lucio Costa convinced the minister to disregard the competition winner and give him the project. So much for competitions. Lucio Costa put a team together, a team of young architects, among them a young intern named Oscar Niemeyer. They got Le Corbusier to join the, the team. Le Corbusier came to Brazil by Zeppelin. We had that at that time. While pretending to be doing a series of conferences in Brazil, he was working into the project. Niemeyer and Le Corbusier got off from the start, and the young Oscar was the draftsman and translator of Le Corbusier ideas to the team. When the building was completed, Le Corbusier claimed authorship and fees. A big mess ensued, but after some bickering, and discussions, they all became friends again. After all, all their involvement with that great master, Le Corbusier, Lucio Costa and Niemeyer, Oscar Niemeyer, became the deans of modernist Brazilian architecture. A strong friendship between the two, between Lucio and Oscar, was established. The plot thickens. Enters Juscelino Kubitschek, the mayor of Belo Horizonte, capital, state of, capital of the state of Minas Gerais. In 1942, he hires Nehemiah to design a public building named Pampulha. The project becomes wildly renowned, renowned in Brazil. Oscar becomes very close to the mayor, and the mayor becomes Brazil's new charismatic president in 1956. We call him uh, Juscelino Kubitschek, uh, JK, or JK, like your own JFK. JK wanted to take Brazil to modernity with a snap of his fingers. Let's do five years in, 50 years in five, was his slogan. Having some spare time, he also wanted to move the capital to central Brazil. He asked his friends, Nehemiah, to design it. Nehemiah says, no, no, thank you. I just want to do all the buildings. <laughs> now, now Nehemiah has the chance to repay his old boss and friend. He calls Lucio. Of course, there's a competition. But you already know how competitions are in Brazil. Nehemiah's friend was chosen to design the capital. On his bid to the competition, after claiming he didn't want to enter, to enter it, he submits a letter and a few sketches, a dozen sketches. He poetically says that his design follows the idea of a cross, an X marking the spot, a gesture of taking possession. I'm always amazed how some architects seem to confuse their art, architecture, poetry, different things. The talk doesn't match the walk. 
The plan was totally copied from Le Corbusier's urban ideas. He proposed a separation of functions, speeding cars, crossing highways, no streets, no sidewalks, sculptural objects separated by beautiful lawns, clean and deserted, no density, no urban interconnectivity, no people. People had no room in, uh, in there. They would only spoil the beautiful and clean picture. But they built Lucius' plan, and most of Nehemiah's buildings, and both achieved the status of gods, genius in Brazil. You know, not all geniuses are good. <laughs> Some of Nehemiah's projects are beautiful, were beautiful. Take the Palácio do Amarati, the Palácio do Planalto, and the Alvorada Palace. But those were done in 1960. What after? Nehemiah is often credited with adding curves to the straight lines of modernism. He famously said, it's not this right angle that attracts me nor the straight line created by man. What attracts me is the free and sensual curves of the mountains of my country, the rivers, and the body of a woman. Beautiful words, maybe beautiful lines, but what about the user of the space? It's always impossible to use a Nehemiah building. They are too hot, too cold, too noisy, too dry, too dark, too, too impossible to use. Human beings were not his concern. Furthermore, our president JK, JK, the guy missing an F, had to build the new capital in three years, in the middle of nowhere. No infrastructure, no roads, no power lines. They transported cement by, and bricks by plane. Nobody was ever able to calculate the cost of building Brazilian. But some consider it the single most important cause in the hyperinflation we had in the following decades. And no one will figure the hidden cost to our politics, our society, and the end to our nation that that type of urbanism carried. When When I realized the daunting effort it was to build Brasilia, I asked myself how Brazil had the energy to focus on and building so, 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 such concepts that nobody else did. Why we did it, I frankly don't understand. By the way, JK also the biggest promoter of the car industry. In Brazil, as, uh, those symbol of our modernity and development. Funny how those things still evade us after more than half a century. It's like our logo, order and progress. We still don't have it, We're still waiting for that. Now, maybe what I consider the strangest thing, deserving a place in the Ripley's, believe it or not, show is the scant criticism in Brazil we have for Lucio, Brazilians, or Nehemiah's building. Criticism is reduced to a footnote in relation to the huge glorification that those two have. And those unrevised, uncriticized urban ideas had a lasting influence in our country. We got stuck in it, we, got, we could not move forward. But maybe I should add a parenthesis here. I do love modern buildings. I'm doing one, that's a modern building. My biggest issue is, is urbanism. Still, maybe I should say something else in their favor. They were from the early machine time. They would know, know better. They were dreaming about the dignified housing, the living machine, dignified tailor 
terrorist cities. Even wrong, I can sympathize with their dream of dignified housing in cities. I did all that the tour about Brasilia, urban problems, and developers' bad rap to get to our project in Brasilia. Funny enough, it all, it's all connected, and it all it started by chance. Back in 2007, a friend asked me, Rafael, have you some, I have some business in Brasilia. Why don't you come with me? I said, OK, I, I'm not doing anything else. Let's go. And there I was standing in this huge open field, missing the opportunity to say something of historical significance. I just mumbled, this is huge. <laughs> it was really huge. It was really huge. Um, with 16 million meters of land and 5 million meters of sellable real estate, it was big. And that day, I was there looking at the site with a very humble desire to help our cities. Altruism filled my soul. I hardly could think about the huge amount of money that the deal could bring. Maybe just a little. It crossed my mind. You see, it, I had a, an irresistible, irresistible pull towards that site. As the, as if all had happened, not by chance, but by destiny. What an opportunity we were granted, right next to Brasilia, to do all that. As you all know, Brasilia was Brazil's idea of moving the capital to the center of Brazil. Saw that? What they did is that they carved out what they called federal district a 50,000 hectares area, and right in the middle is what we call Plano Piloto, the small portion where Lucio Costa's cross was designed. Around the core, they built a large green, the idea is to build a green, a green belt. And the plan was that the city would have 500,000 people, but today it's already two and a half million people, and pretty soon, we figure it will be three, three and a half million people. They had, Lucy Costa's egalitarian plan was that the government and all its cadres, high or low, rich or poor, would work and reside in the Plano Piloto as equals. It didn't work. Because when the workers that came to build Brasilia, and they came from everywhere from Brazil, they all came to work, that was a mecca for work. And they came, and when they decided to stay, they had no room in, in Lucio Costa's plan. They built some favelas and settlements, and they, but the, very quickly, they were pushed away to the satellite cities, satellite towns. So they couldn't live inside the Plano Piloto. They had to live elsewhere. All those satellite towns, and today they have to commute by bus one or two hours every day. Inside Brasilia, there are only about 350,000 people living. But during all the, almost all of the jobs are there. So they drive in by bus, all poor, and they go out in the evening. Most recently, all those towns have amalgamated, and Brazil is becoming a, a big conurbation. Our land is quite close to Brasilia. And also, you can see it's quite big in relation to the Brasilia. It's about the size of one full portion of the one wing of, the, of Brasilia. Here, too, we thought about having to look beyond the sites, beyond the boundary of our sites, because we are interconnected with existing populations. So when we desi we're designing our urban plans for an overall area, storm water, uh, public transportation, sewage, everything, we have to think 
beyond the site. We call this area Colorado sobre Jim. But the interesting thing about Brasilia is that this already exists in our site. We have about 30,000 people living in seven or 8,000 houses living in our site without title, without any approvals. They built as, as a favela, but they built even eight, eight stories building. But although they have legally they, they would be a favela, they are rich people favelas. They all have swimming pools, and they all, they are, the houses here are worth half a million or more. So before we start with uh, the rest of the development, we'll be doing what we call regularization. So out of the 16 million meters we have, about 8 million is already occupied. So our plan now is to sell each one of those 30,000 people the, the, the title for their land. It's a lot of smiles there. But it's a tough, tough work being done by my son, Ricardo. The rest is development areas. We have 8 million meters of development areas. Out of that 8 million, we'll use about 5 million for public space. We're doing a 3 million meters park. And on the 3 million that's left, we're going to build about 5 million meters. It's a huge thing, probably the best, the largest uh, urban development in Brazil. And it's not a parcel, man. Most people do just partner. We're doing a city, and we're thinking about a city. And to do that, we're doing uh, workshops. We call these guys uh, from PPS, Gary, Dave George Wilhelm, and um, David Sims from Gell. And we're all working on these plans and these, uh, these workshops. And we come in with a grid. We don't, we don't want to do the same mistakes in the past. We don't want to define too much. We don't want to leave room for the city to grow. But we need the city to grow. So we have master plan approved. Well, the names are just names, as you know. So our plan is very simple, to make a city people will enjoy living on it. Our dream is a walkable city with streets, sidewalks, squares full of people, no highways, no highway for speeding vehicles, dividing everything, but small streets for slowing cars, yielding to pedestrians, public transportation that dignifies lives, Cits, cities not cast in ideologies but malleable to change, not sterile monuments, nor prefabricated hives of conformity, no ode to futuristic machines or nostalgia for fantasized bucolic rural life, no hate for men disguised as law for mankind, as sometimes I feel is, uh, is what epitomizes some of the modernist thinking. We want our cities to be urbane. We want to make good urbanism the strongest selling point in our project. This, this sculpture is a famous sculpture in Brazil done by Bruno Giorgio. It's called Candangos. Candangos is a sort of depreciative name for the work that came to work in Brazil. Nowadays, everybody is a Candango in Brazil. It's kind of what we call the guys that born in Brazil. And, but it's an empty honor, this sculpture, because Brasilia was not done for them. They were the excluded part of Brasilia, despite all the talk about the equality, uh, equality and all that, that uh, Lucio had. Some are, uh, we are all equals, but some are more equals than others. It's my dream that, that someday the Candangos will be able to walk on the streets, bike to work, sit, i sit in, a, in a park and enjoy the sun, or in a sidewalk cafe and watch people coming, and enjoy, enjoy life. That's the, the dream I have for them, and that's an experience none of them has today. 
To sum up my walk, I want to say that it was a walk from site to city in search of a new urban ethics. And I think us as developers, I won't talk about architects, but just as developers, we need to find a new ethics, how to deal and how to look to our cities. The challenge we present to Sunil in our study is to design this environment, the urban environment, to create a city. In closing, I would like to apologize to Dean uh, Robert Stan. A few months ago, I asked him about what should I speak. He said, stick to what you know. And as you saw, I went way beyond that. <laughs> he also said, I want you to bring reality to the students, the business reality to the students. And I only brought dreams and fantasies. But uh, I'm afraid that's all I could do. So Dean Stern, my sincerest apologies. <laughs> and thank you for having me. Thank you, Sunil, for all your help. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. The nice thing about being a dean is nobody ever pays any attention to you, but that's good. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk. Would you take questions? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I think there must be I a few. I don't know about the answers, but the questions they can Well, <laughs> developers never lack for answers. <laughs> Are there questions for Raphael Behrman? Down here, please. We, we, we need a mic. Thank you very much. Uh, you talked a fair bit about ideas coming from Europe and North America to Brazil. Do you see much in the way of export of urbanistic ideas from Brazil to uh, the US, for instance? I, I think we in Brazil, uh, I was just talking about that over lunch, we are a big country, and maybe because of that we close ourselves. We don't like much importation, we don't like foreign architects, and that reduces our ability to grow and to develop a good, strong architecture. I don't think we have a strong architecture today. I, have, I, think we, I know we have great talent in the country, but I think they've been um, hammered and, and pushed down by, by the ghost of uh, that lived until a couple of years ago, Oscar Niemeyer, so, and uh, I don't know, very few architects I know that uh, from Brazil that went abroad. Frankly, I, I don't, I'm not very hopeful in that term. I don't see much. Leon, Greer? Wait, wait, wait for the mic. Yeah. Interesting that such a critique of Niemeyer should come from you. But it's so interesting that Niemeyer's own house in Brasilia is a traditionally designed uh, thinker with Roman tiles, you know it? No. <laughs> it's in a book of all his houses. It's, I could have designed it. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be interesting to see how, why he did that, because in his own town. I uh, think in the end he was a smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions or comments? Well then I think we'll thank our speaker again and join him in the gallery for...